Hey friends, Heather Creekmore here. We've got an awesome show for you today. We're continuing our interview with Tracy Brown talking about all the symptoms that can come sometimes even years later after seasons, years, decades of restricting food. But before I tell you more about that, I want to tell you about a awesome homeschool program, Christian homeschool program called Classical Conversations. Are you maybe a little concerned that your child's current education won't give them the skills necessary to succeed in any area of life? Well, consider homeschooling with Classical Conversations. By applying the classical Christian model of education, the Classical Conversations curriculum encourages students to learn how to learn and how to think for themselves so they can adapt to every challenge life throws at them. And I can attest to that. We've been using Using this program for 10 years in my home, and I love how it's worked for us. Join the over 50,000 families in 50 countries like me who have chosen to educate their children with Classical Conversations and visit classicalconversations.com backslash compared to who. That's classicalconversations.com backslash compared to who. Now, before we dig into the second part of my interview with Tracy Brown, I want to pause and encourage you. You did the best you could with what you knew to do. So don't feel any guilt or shame as you hear about these physical repercussions of dieting or food restriction. Just like me, friend, we operated under the system we knew, and it had an impact for a lot of us. But there's no sense in blaming or shaming or feeling guilt. We can feel remorse, but not guilt. I don't think that's what God wants for us. And I certainly don't want that for you as you listen to this interview today. Instead, my hope is to educate. My hope is to help you connect the dots. If you're having some of the symptoms we talked about in the last episode or some of the GI related symptoms, or we're talking about today, I just want you to kind of gain a little bit of an understanding like, oh, wow, hmm, that could be where this came from. It might not be, but it could be. So I hope that you don't walk away from this with any guilt or shame, but rather walk away from it informed and educated and maybe even a little fired up right? Maybe even a little angry with the messages that the world and diet culture have told us about how we should care for our bodies and maybe ready to care for your body in a different way, in a way that's actually kinder for your body and more responsive and cooperative with the way God designed our bodies to eat. So that's my prayer for you as we go into the show. I want to tell you two other things real quickly. First of all, I'm going to take two more coaching clients this spring. So if that's you, if you hear this and you think I'm one of those two, yep, it's time for me to get in coaching. Now's my time. I want you to drop me a message, Heather at compared to you.me right away so you can grab one of those spots. And the second thing is the burden of better will be 99 cents on Kindle starting May 1st, but only for a week or so. So grab it. If you haven't read it yet, go download it, share it with friends, grab that book. It would be a great time maybe to do like a summer study around the book. I mean, wouldn't you like to have a comparison free summer? I think I would, right? Everyone wants that, I hope. So grab the book, grab some friends, and maybe get together and read it together. But 99 cents is an unbeatable offer. It's a limited time. I hope you'll go check it out. Welcome to Compare to Who, the podcast to help you make peace with your body so you can savor God's rest and feel his love. If you're tired of fighting body image the world's way, Compare to Who is the show for you. You've likely heard lots of talk about loving your body, but my goal is different. Striving to fall in love with stretch marks and cellulite is a little silly to me. Instead, I want to encourage you and remind you with the truth of scripture that you are seen, you are known, and you are loved no matter what your size or shape. Here, the pressure is off. If you're looking for real talk, biblical encouragement, and regular reminders that God loves you and you're not alone, you've come to the right place. I hope you enjoy today's show and hey, tell a friend about it. Tracy Brown, thanks for coming back. 
and talking to us about all these kind of weird physical things that can happen in our bodies when we don't eat enough, when we are in an eating disorder, or even to be clear, disordered eating, which could be as simple as I've followed diets for the last couple of years or a couple of decades for some of my listeners. And so we had a great conversation last time about skin and bones and periods, (laughs) all those things. But today I want to dig more into the GI stuff, because I think this is one that is more common to many, many people who have had um, any kind of disordered relationship with food. And and I do want to share my experience here because I have had some of you listeners reach out to me and say, I have this weird thing. And I'm like, yeah, I have this weird thing too. Now I will put the disclaimer on it that my doctor has not said, you know, oh, Heather, this is because you were a disordered eater yeah. or had an eating disorder. There's, there's never been that kind of connection made from, from someone in the medical profession for me. Okay. So, so some of these opinions are my own, right. And, and I should probably put the disclaimer, this isn't medical advice here either, right. We're just kind of talking through the reality of our experiences and Tracy's experience, um, as, as someone who works with eating disordered clients, I started having this kind of weird gag response to food right after I had my fourth child. Mm -hmm. And I would eat something pretty benign and only a bite of it. Like for example, a pancake, right? So not, you know, we're not talking Taco Bell. (laughs) Okay. I would have a bite of pancake plain and I would get it kind of stuck in my esophagus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it would eventually go down and sometimes I would have to throw it up. And I actually was able to get treatment pretty quickly for that. I had just had a baby. So there were some tests that they didn't want to run like a barium swallow because I was still breastfeeding and things, but they did expand my esophagus and they told me my esophagus was too small. And that was the problem. They, they expanded it with a balloon and told me that I'd probably be good for 10 years and to come back. Well, Mm -hmm. my 10 years was up a couple of years ago and I started having this symptom more regularly where I would eat anything like it, there was no pattern to what it was. I would have Mm -hmm. something and it would get stuck in my esophagus and I would feel like I needed to, to get it out of there. Otherwise I, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) it wasn't that I couldn't breathe, but I just, nothing else was going to happen until that that changed. And, and at times it is violent at times mm. it is, Oh, it's coming now, which is really embarrassing. If you're at a restaurant or at a friend's house or at a stranger's house, which I've had all of the above happen. Um, <laughs> fact, oh my goodness. Just a few weeks. So I had another procedure and, and they did the same thing. Uh, they told me I have a sonophilic esophagitis. Mm-hmm. So I have some sort mm-hmm. of allergic reaction happening in my esophagus. But even after all that, just a couple of weeks ago, I was at a restaurant in Florida. And I mean, I had it's, praise God, they had an outdoor space that no one was in. I, Tracy, I had to get up, rush out the door, out to the outside and, yeah. and violently throw up what was in my esophagus. And I feel bad for all the people at the neighboring restaurants because they got the idea that that restaurant I was eating at was not a very good restaurant. <laughs> it wasn't about the restaurant at all. I probably need to go get, leave them a good Yelp review. But, but I've had other people talk to me about their esophagus issues. Mm-hmm. I know, um, that IBS, um, you know, just digestive stuff. So can we start kind of at the esophagus and then maybe work down to, to stomach stuff? So like, what, what have you seen? What's common? Like, as I'm sharing my crazy, what are you thinking? <laughs> well, so your condition is a autoimmune one and they don't really know what causes that in people. Um, on autoimmune diseases in general, there's not like like there's a level of like idiopathic. We don't really know, you know, with me from a trauma informed perspective, I'm always looking at like, okay, how long is somebody being that been in this con- you know, chronic fight, flight, freeze, or please response that makes people more vulnerable to autoimmune diseases. But regardless, I know your, your condition is either environmental aller, like some kind of allergy or some kind of food thing. Um, and 
I don't know how what, how deep you want to go into your your condition, but it basically it's a um, it's a response, and it has to be treated with like you know food um, investigating food reactions, mm -hmm. steroids, things like that to kind of keep that open, and and you know sometimes surgical procedures to keep that open. Um, it's a little separate from like pretty what we would think of other GI conditions because it has this autoimmune aspect to it. But okay. when people have this condition, I have seen that it's you're more likely to have ARFID, fear of food, fear of eating, fear of choking, fear of not breathing. So it really easily turns into um, orthorexic tendencies or ARFID. So that's what I see a lot with this condition. Tell me ARFID. I know what it stands for, but why don't you tell the listeners what yeah. ARFID stands for? So um, I can't remember all the acronyms anymore. I've been yeah. treating this for so long, but um, it's basically there's three different kinds or sensory, whereas like people are reluctant to eat. I'll say reluctant, hesitant to eat because sensory wise, textures, flavors, everything's too much. Your sensory system is like, I might feel squishy. And then somebody, or let's just say ketchup. Somebody with pretty severe sensory ARFID would be like, eat ketchup that takes every individual ingredient in it. And that's just too overwhelming. It's just too much. So they just avoid somebody with ARFID um, that have it as a trauma related to that. They got sick and then they're afraid to eat red food and then anything that has red food on it and it chains, mm -hmm. right? Um, that's some, and, and then basically sometimes fear of, of vomiting can cause ARFID, you know? So it didn't start with the food, but eating can, eating something gives you the um, the hypervigilance happens every single time somebody eats. So there's a threat response. So there's different ways it shows up. Um, it doesn't usually connect it with body image, mm -hmm. but sometimes ARFID can turn into anorexia as well, mm -hmm. you know, and, and vice versa. So that's ARFID, fear of um, negative consequences around eating. Mm -hmm. So it's very, your, your food becomes very limited, which causes, it obviously causes malnutrition. Yeah. So. Yeah. Which I would think, ARFID. I think I actually had some of that when I was nursing, because I had made the connection with my first, that dairy was an issue. And with my second, yeah. it was dairy and something else. And by the time I got to my third, like I was pretty much left with, I know applesauce is safe. And, okay. <laughs> and he had to stop there nursing, there it is. right. There it he is. had to stop nursing yeah. because I didn't have enough nutrients. I, I mean, no doctor told okay. me that, but now so the, the connection with pre-existing, let's say it, it's hard again, you, know, you, you said like, I probably had an eating disorder since I was a teenager, which means you probably had some, you had threat response on board before you ever had an eating disorder. And it's like, either I can have a pre-existing gut health autoimmune thing going before the eating disorder, which creates a more threat response and more likely to have more kinds of eating disorders yeah. and OCD, or you had some of that pre-existing OCD ish tendencies, obviously trauma on board, OCD is a trauma response, like a symptom anyway. Mm -hmm. So you see how these things can happen. So if you, um, let's say that you get, let's say before you don't have any disorder, but you've got IBS or some kind of other functional gut health issue. And then you go and self-treat or don't get really, really appropriate um, psychological and nutritional help for your gut health issue. A quarter of people go on to develop either ARFID or some kind of eating disorder because you're trying to use food to treat everything. And before you know it, you're afraid to eat, you get malnourished, now your brain doesn't work as well to make decisions anymore, and then full-blown stuff. So yeah, um, that's really common. Or flip side, we're probably talking 85% plus of people who have a history of disordered eating, eating disorders end up getting some kind of gut health issue. It could be 90, 95%, you know, it's really high. Let's just say 80% up, end up as time goes by getting having something go on that has to be treated and work with the intersection of like the history and what the body needs to heal. So, yeah. 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 So let's talk about that more. So the gut health issues come from, well, like me, when you only eat plain Turkey or applesauce or, or my, my pre diet or pre wedding diet was like salmon burgers yeah. and a couple, okay. like when I was eating only eating three or four foods, right? Yeah. Like yeah. that changes. Well, let's go from the right? esophagus down. You're yeah, right. Okay. So if you yeah, have a limited diet, either limited nutritionally and limited calorically. So what's going to happen? You're going to start to have atrophy of all your GI muscles. So esophagus, gut, larger and small intestine, colon, rectum, all those things. So 
when you do eat different foods or more foods, you're going to have symptoms, not because the food's bad, but because like, whoa, we don't really produce those enzymes that much anymore to digest that food. So then you have pain or gas or distension um, and an altered gut biome. Not because you even had a, you did not have a GI issue before the, the, the diet, yeah. but now you do. Yeah. Um, if there's purging on board, so you can have, again, um, gastritis, which is inflammation of your, your stomach, any place in your gut, um, below that or in your esophagus as well. And, and the same thing, then if you don't purge your food, then you're going to, of course, have pressure, gas, pain, bloating, and it just becomes cyclical. Is just putting a lot of wear and tear on your gut to have to go through this. Okay. Um, binging the same thing, say all the same symptoms. Like you're having this dilation of your, of your gut, your muscles, all those things up and down, up and down, up and down, just puts the wear and tear on your body. Um, and people start to self perceive that the trigger is the food. It's like, no, it's, it's mm-hmm. the outcome of the behaviors, the restricting, the binging, the purging, the let's say lots of use if you're using laxatives or diet pills, of course the diet pills hurt your nervous system and your cardiovascular system, but laxatives damage the nerves and the muscles in your large intestine and your colon. Yeah. Um, plus also get rid of nutrients that you would have absorbed, right? Yeah. So that's where over time, these things don't happen overnight. We're talking months, years, decades. Mm-hmm. And then we start to recover. You're like, oh my goodness, I'm dying here. What's wrong with me? you know, it's going to take some time to heal your gut lining and all the organs that have had um, the malnutrition to deal with. So yeah. that's why you're having the symptoms, not because the food's hurting you. It feels like it because it's there in the space where you have that deterioration, that inflammation, same thing. Um, oh, your muscles. So all your muscles in your GI tract and also your pelvic floor yeah. are going to deteriorate as well, you know? Yeah. So incontinence happens and prolapse happens and hemorrhoids yeah. happen because there just hasn't been the nutrition for this to maintain the structural integrity of your organs. Yeah. I'm, and I'm glad you said the pelvic floor thing because I did episodes yeah. on that last fall. Yeah. Um, actually a great organization, Tighten Your Tinkler, uh, <laughs> sponsored the show yeah. last fall. Uh, go back and listen to those episodes. I think you can still cash in on the, uh, the promo code for their program, but that was a new revelation yeah. for me. And then all the things that pelvic, if your pelvic floor isn't strong, if your pelvic floor muscles are weak, all, like we connected that all the way to my bunions. <laughs> That's yes. how random yes. that was, but it's, yeah. it's crazy. Our bodies are so interconnected, but as I think mm-hmm. about like stomach stuff, mm-hmm. I think about, so from a body image perspective, right. A lot of my clients that come from eating disorder backgrounds, they still struggle with, I feel like my stomach sticks out. And some of that is actually physical, right? No, absolutely. No, you can have it either. And so if you're, again, go back to if you've been chronically dieting or just had a food, like a food group limited diet, you're not going to have the same abdominal wall that you did before you started dieting. Mm. And so you don't have the musculature to hold in your organs as well. Mm. Don't go doing 20,000 crunches. Got If you don't eat enough food, you're not going to have anything to re- There's nothing to rebuild. Yeah. It won't work. So yeah. this is really about um, getting enough fuel in to because your body wants to restore what your body's made to be. So it'll restore some of that body musculature without you doing a single ab thing. You know, <laughs> if you want to work on core stability, yes. Awesome. Go for it. You know, have help to do it. So it doesn't become compulsive, but um the other thing I want to mention is that gastroparesis as well. If you've got delayed gastric emptying from either just the damage from purging or the damage from not eating enough, the only thing that fixes that is food. Now, some people do end up in a situation at some point where the body just doesn't do it on something. You might need to be on gut motility drugs. Mm-hmm. And, and in some cases, I've seen that people have surgeries to fix these things and you know more, more severe cases. But gastric motility being slowed down means it's just kind of hanging out and you probably have that sensate that experience of like when you first start stop dieting or the chaos from the restricting binging stops it feels like things aren't moving because there's a reality to that and you will feel bloated gassy distended time will fix that in most people time you know refeeding and time you know not dieting anymore some people need again some support to do that with 
enzymes and probiotics and again, mm -hmm. whatever, like a symptom mediating, you know, substances, meds, whatever. But for the most part, your body, again, wants to run. It wants to get its BMR back up. That your gastric motility wants to increase, but it only happens with eating. And obviously, you know, working on your, if you're in fight or flight a lot, or if you're dissociative a lot, that also will puts a priority on safety seeking and not on digestion mm. as well. So that's a whole other system we might not have time to talk about, but I know that I was here before Heather talking about trauma and threat responses, threat responses, slow down gut health, gut, oh, gut motility and digestion as well. So if you're going into your meal thinking, oh my gosh, I have to do this because this is the right thing to do, but I'm scared to do it. You're better off slowing down first and getting yourself back into safety and then resuming your meal yeah. because you are setting yourself up for like, probably some gas yeah. or nausea or something. Yeah. Well, I was just thinking about, we touched on this a little bit in the last episode, but I was thinking about how I remember used to being afraid of certain meals. Right. Sure. Yeah. And, and as I look back, like those were certainly the meals that I had all kinds of digestive issues around. Even I remember going yeah. to my birthday, going to the cheesecake factory for my birthday one year and I, I had been really restricting. And so, you know, woo, all bets are off now, right? The, the, the binge was coming and I mean, I was never a purger, but boy, it had mm -hmm. to come up and I had, you know, and wow. so, so, and then, and then of course, so the Afrid, right? Like thinking like, oh, and then next, so then it's like, I convinced myself, oh, I'm just allergic to the cheesecake That's it. factory, That's <laughs> right? right. I'm a, what did I eat? Oh, I ate cheesecake. Okay. I must not be able yeah. to have cheesecake or, you know, what, uh, right. you know, what else did I have? Like, oh, well I must have sensitivities to all these foods. And, and now that I'm able to eat some of those foods freely without it being any big deal, it's like, oh wait, or was it just that I was really scared? I really psyched myself right. into, into those is. digestive issues. So yeah, it happens all the time, which is how these things get snowball. You go from one eating disorder to another because of our symptomology versus, Hey, what is the big picture? What's happening here? Yeah. yeah. And this is what we talked. We're just barely touching on a little bit today is you have to look at what's my state. What's the, the long-term of what my body has been through as I go to reintroduce new foods. Um, and again, this is cu very culturally accepted and even pushed is the functional medicine route to fix everything. And sometimes we do need to adjust our food for symptomology or maybe for long-term, but most of the things that we do, I know as dietitians do this work do, is that we're doing the least possible restrictions as possible and really work on relationship and, and regulation um, and to understand, um, help people understand that this is a process to get your body back to feeling safe to eat and get your mind to like, okay, what's the truth about what are these symptoms really about? Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to touch quickly on, uh, on, on purging, on bulimia, especially because I know that we, we spent some time on anorexia and anorexia type tendencies, but I do know that I have some younger listeners maybe who are still even in the throes of that, who may not understand mm -hmm. what that looks like long-term. And okay. so can we talk about teeth, right? Can we Curation, talk about- It's just, it, so our stomach- for a very good reason, has a high, high, high pH, so acid content, because it's breaking down our food and it also killing bacteria just that we take in through our nose, our mouth, our, you know, life is life. There's no perfect, you know, preservation of food. So that's what it's for, though, mm. it's to like kill most things. And this, our esophagus and our teeth aren't meant to be exposed to that level of pH. Mm. So it's a break, if it's killing bacteria and viruses and all that good stuff, um, all kinds of other things in our environment, from everything, it's going to eat through our, our very tender cells. So our teeth are very strong, but it takes a long time, but they can get worn away. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and, and then I had read about, um, vision issues as well, which you mentioned a little bit and related to anorexia, but that purging actually can cause retinal detachment and well the pressure is very violent yeah. to purge yeah you know, there's a different I mean, we've all experienced this where we have had food poisoning and it's like it's not it's not in my control you know <laughs> you should get your body saying i can't deal with this yep. and that's so if your stomach acid can't deal with it 
that's the result, which is so cool. I mean, it's, I know it's kind of feeling not so cool, but for a geek like me, it's like, oh, well, my stomach acid can't handle my body will get rid of. That's super mm-hmm. cool. Thank yeah. you, body. Um, but when we're trying to force vomiting, it's very violent. Mm-hmm. So of course it's violent. And that's what will damage some of the musculature, your stomach, your esophagus, your throat, but it's also putting backward pressure on your sinuses that which is behind your eyes and prep pressure on your eyes. So that's, yeah. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, just as we wrap up, like what, what are we missing, Tracy? Is there anything? Well, I think it's really interesting that, I mean, it's a very, very high percentage of people who either who have an eating disorder, who either had some all their life, they remember this. And I, I know personally that I had chronic constipation way before I had an eating disorder in high school, but that was a symptom of relational trauma, some other stuff. So that makes sense to me that like mm-hmm. a body that's was designed to run a certain way, um, you know, for me to like be constantly like holding on means uh, that's protection, right? Mm-hmm. So I already had that preceding. It's not a big shock to develop an eating disorder because it's another way of control and holding on and bracing and protection. So that can be pre-existing. And of course, when you're trying to recover, that symptomology comes back full force and you've got to work through it. And it's not surprising that if you've had a, if you've had years, months, years, decades of any kind of disordered eating, even if you think you're being healthy, but if you don't have diversity of food and you don't have enough food, you're going to have some kind of deterioration of one or many of your organ systems over time. That's just reality. Mm -hmm. And we do jump to, self-diagnosing. And I want to, you know, relate to people like sometimes your gut stuff isn't IBS, isn't SIBO. It can be related to other things too, around our, again, our, our our ovaries. There's there's lots of things that's so important to just rule out because I just want to give a quick list here. I wrote some stuff down because um, it's very easy to get not just a bad diagnosis or not diagnosed correctly. So a lot of other things that are associated with GI things, um, you've got genetic factors, there's abuse history, there's um, um, just the other maybe GI disturbances you might have, but we could also have IBD or SIBO or um, an infection or something going on with some pancreatic insufficiency, like enzyme stuff. Um, Gosh, there's so many things that, you know, we want uh, people get um, tested for. um, Oh, I know this is in the book that you were referencing earlier, but just. um, You're not just viruses and infections, but get get all this tested. But if you got it tested once, don't over get over tested either, because sometimes (laughs) it's like, oh, I don't have a GI problem. I just have a I just have an eating disorder problem. And once I kind of get this resolved, my gut health stuff will get better. So we try to be really thorough because it's not always one thing. It's a, it can be an intersection of a couple of things. And yeah. so um, the worst thing you can do though, is really, Oh, I get bloated. I'll restrict. That's just the worst thing you can do, to be honest. Mm-hmm. It feels like it eliminates your symptoms, mm-hmm. but your symptoms are really just a symptom of a body that just wants to be fed. And we have to work through it versus yeah. get rid of all the food. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And so what you just said, you know, with my esophagus stuff, like they tested me for H. pylori the first time yeah, and a, a couple other things, and they didn't really have any answers for me. And so still in a disordered eating mindset, I went the route of, okay, I'm going to figure out exactly what it is. And I got, um, the, uh, IgG testing for food sensitivity. Mm-hmm. And again, it didn't give me any satisfactory answers because none of my, <laughs> the only two things on my whole list that showed up as red were grapes and goat cheese. Mm-hmm. And it just so uh-huh. happened. Like I know this years later, the day before I had, it was, I was hosting something and I made this hors d'oeuvre with grapes and goat cheese. <laughs> that I ate a lot of. And so those were the only two things in the whole world that I was actually having a food sensitivity to sensitivity to according to this specific test. And, but everything else was a yellow, a medium. And so it was like, Oh goodness, I'm just going to have to live without all these foods. So I don't have this problem anymore. And, and, and that wasn't, it turned out that I've been okay with all those foods. So so I'm just, I'm sharing my experience to encourage someone go ahead. Yeah. So that's a really, that is a prototypical example of what we see Yeah, is that like, you've had all these symptoms and not connecting it to the malnutrition. And then people go down the functional medicine rabbit hole 
And they end up actually doing more damage to their microbiome because you limited diversity of food. Yeah. So if you want to heal your gut, you got to eat more food, diversity of food. Um, now, if that stuff isn't fixing you, then we go this, if you've never done all of this testing, then we go to like, I think, I know this sounds crazy. Let's go get tested for a parasite. And lo and behold, yeah, you got something from the cruise you went on five years ago. Mm-hmm. That stuff happens too. Yeah. You, you know, so if you want one direction to try to fix it and there's no satisfaction, know that there's probably something else. If you've gone the medical route first and nothing is working, you no parasites, no SIBO, no diverticulitis. It's like, let me look at your food. Oh, you're restricting. Okay. That's your, mm-hmm. that's the root of your problem. Yeah. I mean, before that's the rejection issues, but that's another story, yeah. but yeah. There's also, there's a ground zero to all this. We just have to figure it out outside of diet culture because that's, there's no help there. Right, right. Eliminating the food may be the opposite of the answer. (laughs) Is that the right way to say? I think I said that completely wrong. Eliminating the food may not be the answer you hope it is. And I think especially for those of us with eating disorder background, we always, we hope it's the food. We want to be allergic to something. We hope that the test comes out that I can't eat this thing because that will actually help me be a better quote unquote dieter. Right. And and the the negative reinforcement to that is if you're scared of food, if you're scared of weight gain, then you go eat the food. And you have a, re- of course, you're going to have a reaction because you're already a threat response. So we have to really work on the threat responses. And this is a renewal of the mind issue. Yeah. Really. If you want to help your gut, let's work on your mind. <laughs> right. That's not even intuitive either. But again, yeah. um, we weren't born this way. Yeah. Yeah. I just wrote a line today, Tracy, that said maybe our issues aren't about biology, but about theology. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. I think, you know, that's that. There that's it, it. Well, Tracy, thanks. Thanks so much for being on the show today and helping us kind of dig through some of this hard medical stuff. And I do, uh, what what would you leave people with? You know, like if you're feeling these symptoms, go do this. Oh my goodness. Um, These things are really hard to tease out because again, we've talked about multiple issues. So in a session that we work with people, we're looking at your history, your beliefs, um, the things you've already tried. I mean, and, and your nervous system health and your trauma history. So it's like, we're working on kind of holding space for about four things at one time, usually when we're looking at these things and you can only really make one change at a time. Yeah. Don't try to do a bunch of things at a time because it's too much and you can't isolate the factors because you have to isolate about four things at once when you're eating a meal, my state, my beliefs, the food itself, um, and just the phase of recovery you're in. What makes sense now of what is, happening you probably won't have a symptom with this later but for right now you do mm-hmm. and 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 you have to hold space for like what's happening here now is going to be different in three months six months whatever. yeah so that's good are you still taking virtual clients yeah okay so i'll put information if you want to connect with tracy all that information will be in the show notes if you want to work with someone like her to get on a new path i would encourage you to do that um Thanks again, Tracy, for being on the show Thank today. Thank you for okay. having me. I hope something today has helped you stop comparing and start living. Compared to who is excited to be part of the Life Audio Podcast Network. For more great Christian podcasts, go to lifeaudio.com.